Richard Jeffries from the co-chairs of the CARE Collaboratory CAP in the HIV Working Group. And we've done this for a number of years, and many of you have attended this, and we're glad to be able to continue this tradition. Um, so why don't we just go around the room and briefly say you know, who you are and where you're from, so we have a feel for who's who. Me? Um, I'm Liz Heileman. I'm a, a, a an HIV treatment writer, HIV and hepatitis, and I work for HIV and hepatitis.com, AIDS map, Bay Area reporter, and various other outlets. Um, I'm Gus Cairns, I'm an editor at AIDSmap.com, and I also do prevention work for EATG. Press is quarantined in the front row here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not press. Um, my name is Eric Montauk, I'm with the uh, uh, Forum for Collaborative HIV Research, and I manage our Forum HIV Care Project. Steve Mason, I'm with Mr. Marshall I'll be presenting uh, after yeah, five years. Uh, I'm George Hanna, I'm with Bristol Myers Good. I will receive virology drug development data. Okay, good morning. My name is Angel Hernandez. I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm a community educator and I'm with the AVAC PS4 program and the ACPD Community Scientific Subcommittee. So, good morning. My name is Javier Martinez from Barcelona. I'll be presenting San Esteban this morning, working at the H Research Institute in Barcelona. And uh, just uh, speaking of which, um, I, Fred and Afar have very generously offered to um, videotape the morning presentations. Any so, speakers um, would be available to put the wireless mic on before you start to speak? It would be great if you don't want to be uh, presented or recorded or not, just let me know and I'll turn it off for you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I'm Jeff Shafton. Welcome to Seattle. I'm director of the Office of HIV Network Coordination based here at the Fred Hunch. And I work with the five HIV AIDS clinical trials networks and also an investigator with a local AIDS clinical trial union here. I'm David Evans, I'm with Project Inform in San Francisco, um, and also with the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition. I'm Mike Phil, I work for the AIDS Treatment <coughs> Activist Trials Network at the Fred Hodge here, and I'm a board member of AIDAC. I'm Mark Mokoye, I'm at the Oregon Health Center for Good morning, my name is Mike Lohuk, I'm a member of the AIDS and the Hispano City of Barcelona, Spain. My name is Mark uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Fran Pujol, I'm a member of the ATG, and also work in Barcelona, Catalonia, and with Spanosina. Uh, good morning, I'm Brian West, I'm the, from Asia, Scotland, and the chair of the European AIDS Treatment Group, and also co-chair of the uh, HIV Group. My name is Tomasz Bredski, I'm from Budapest, Hungary, and I'm board, board member of the ATG and co-chair of the Civil Society Forum on HIV and AIDS of, this, of the European Commission. Good morning, my name is George Lovarski, and I'm the scientific officer of the European AIDS Treatment Group. I'm Greg Fowler from Portland, Oregon, and I'm here under HIVHepatitis.com. Morning, Kay Lalzar from San Francisco, an investigator. I'm Jeff Bartlett, I'm from uh, Calumune, uh, senior vice president in charge of clinical research. Um, and I'm Stephen LeBlanc, and I'm a freelance AIDS activist. Hi, I'm Lori Sua. I'm on the Petite HIV Community Advisory Board in the local uh, Seattle ACG Advisory Board. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jens Willem, as well from Petite Denmark, and HIV Denmark, and also EATG. I'm Danielle Houston. I am a community educator at Advance and Research. Good morning, Sigrid Schwarze from Berlin, Germany. I'm also an EATG member and I'm running Project Information in Germany, not to be confused with the American Project Info. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the distance. <laughs> I'm Giulia Maria Corbetti from Italy, Rome, European Aid Treatment Group as well. Uh, Michael Hart <coughs> from Treatment Education Network in Denver, also AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition and Community Rep on the Cure of PSG and the ACTG, along with Andy Cates from San Diego, California. Uh, 
through TSG, uh, care uh, laboratory, and uh, Thank you all. Quick <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> It is BQT. It's a bacon, quail, tomato. <laughs> Zero, two, one, five. And that's lowercase letters. So I forgot to mention I'm from Palm Springs, California. We have geographical locations for everyone. And I'd like to thank uh, the collaborators that uh, have made this possible over the years. Ace Treatment Activist Coalition, Project Inform, um, Treatment Action Group in New York, and the Martin Delaney Caps. Um, so all of us kind of pulled together and uh, helped coordinate this and look at the speakers and make it all possible. Um, in the afternoon, we may have an abbreviated schedule because uh, Linda D was in, one of our presenters was, in, was in, unable, unable to make it. So we're looking to see if we can get uh, speaker phones and get that set up. But if not, um, we might have a longer break before the, at the evening reception. At four o'clock after this ends, immediately afterwards, AVAC, Another one of our collaborators is going to be having a reception for the curriculum um, project, which is um, cure research module, education modules that are being set up as seminars. It's a collabor collaboration between community and volunteer researchers to put together a series of about 15 to 17 different distinct modules on various aspects of uh, cure research, some of which were, were presented uh, for the first time yesterday at a town hall meeting in the Seattle, Labor uh, Seattle, Seattle Life Public Library for the uh, Seattle community. We'll be rolling those out over the next year and you can hear more about that tonight. So without further ado, let's get into our morning program and our first speaker is um, Javier Picardo Martinez and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's the first time I come to this meeting, so I appreciate uh, Jeff and Richard's invitation. And uh, let me uh, start by telling you three things. First is that, um, first is a disclosure. I'll be talking about allogenetic cell transplantation. I'm not an hematologist, so whatever I can say on hematology is something that I learned very recently, but I'll try to do it uh, as best as I can. The second thing is that um, I'm based in Barcelona. I'm working in this institute, the AIDS Research Institute, that is based uh, in one of the major hospitals in town, and we have there an institute that has been working for years in HIV research. and. Um, and we are, we are really proud of the group of people we have there. So again, whatever I'm going to be transmitting to you is not my own contribution, but the contribution of many other people working in the group. <coughs> and third is that I don't know the dynamics you have in these meetings, but because of language constraints, if you think that something I can say you don't understand it, please stop me and say, Javier, can you repeat that? Can you, whatever. So feel completely free about that. So, um, in, in our institute, we're working in different uh, topics, uh, but in the last five years, uh, we've been very interested in understanding how viral persistence, despite of antiretroviral treatment, is happening. And the way I conceptualize that is basically in three major points. One is that we have, uh, and it's something that in our group we've been working uh, strong in, in the past years, we think that we still have residual replication despite of antiretroviral therapy, if not in all individuals who are treated, at least in part of them. Uh, obviously, we have latent infection, and this is clear, and there are many reports that this is a long-term problem for HIV remission. And finally, there is something that we don't quite understand, but we know that along with an incomplete um, cure of HIV, we have an incomplete uh, normalization of the immune activation and inflammation in the body. I mean, antiretroviral therapy is doing a great job in that, 
but this is not normalized. And we don't still understand whether it's immune activation and inflammation that is helping in, in uh, setting up uh, residual replication. Or it's residual replication that's responsible for driving immune activation and inflammation. So these are three major mechanisms. And um, we've been, uh, in the group, we've been working in these uh, four areas. Um, this is probably a slide you have seen because I use it uh, frequently. Uh, we have people working on how to optimize treatments that we already have at hand, and especially the new treatments, how we can do two things. First is how we can combine treatments to, make, to take the most of them. And the second is when we should be treating in, uh, subjects with HIV, and if that makes uh, a difference in, 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 in the outcome. Um, the second area we are trying to work is, is in making uh, a reversal of HIV latency and induced viral production. And this is something we've been doing with different uh, chemical components now, something of the uh, uh, compounds we've been testing are already published, and uh, some of them are in progress. Uh, these are molecules very similar to HDAC inhibitors, but we also have been working with uh, uh, disulfuran, and we also have been working with lithium chloride. The third component is therapeutic vaccination. I have to say that we have, we're lucky that we have two big groups in the institute working on that. The group of Christian Brander, who is working in T-cell uh, immunity, and the group of uh, Julia Blanco, who are working in, in uh, humoral immunity. And the idea is let's try to combine our knowledge on reservoirs with the strategies that we are facing in terms of uh, vaccinating uh, HIV-infected subjects with uh, especially now we're working with CTL vaccines and see whether those CTL vaccines either in combination with HDAC inhibitors or not they can uh, change the size of the reservoir and finally we are um, trying to use immune based therapies and this is something that we are not yet there where we've been starting doing some in vitro experiments and the idea is to move we have some we have a couple of clinical trials uh, on, on check and uh, probably if the uh, European authorities will approve the trials, we'll start working on that uh, during this year. But I uh, didn't come here today to talk of any of these um, areas, but to talk on cell and gene therapy, something that has been quite new for us, but I think we're moving quickly in this area. Uh, this is a story you all know. So we have Timothy Brown, who uh, is the only patient that we believe has been cured from HIV. And you all know the story. Um, I want to just take the opportunity to say that despite we believe that there is no residual virus in, in Timothy Brown, we still don't understand what happened in this case. And if I can make a, a word game, uh, if you look at there, it says patient no more, I could also say and no more patients have been able to follow this path. And this is something that has been sounding in our heads and thinking, well, how can we change this situation um, in the future? Um, you also know about the uh, two Boston patients, two individuals who were HIV positive and they received um, um, transplantation for cells that were not delta 32 homozygous and unfortunately these two patients they um, their plasma viral load rebounded either two, 12 or 32 weeks after treatment interruption uh, I want to use this slide also to tell you ahead of time that that whatever I'm going to be telling you today is not distinct from the Berlin patient or these two patients we've been in very close collaboration with, uh, in this case, with Timothy Henrik and uh, um, Dan Kuritskes to try to understand how, whatever I'm gonna be telling you now, it can be fundamentalized in these two patients and, and also with the uh, Berlin patient. So, as I, as I told you, why only one person has been cured for an HIV? Only one. And in the area of uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation, there are different strategies, and I'm going to be, I'm going to try to transmit you what I learned from this area. One thing is that if a person is in the event of a malignancy, an hematological malignancy, and needs an allogeneic, allogeneic uh, stem cell transplantation, 
That transplantation can happen in different ways. One way is with an HLA-matched sibling donor, someone who is completely identical and, and is being, going to be sharing 10 out of 10 HLA types. For it. In this case, this is the best situation you might have if you need a transplant. But this only happens very rarely. The second situation is someone who is an HLA-matched unrelated donor, someone who is not a relative for you, but by chance is sharing part of your HLA dotation. And in this case, we can play with nine or 10 uh, similar HLA alleles. But this is hard to find. And actually, uh, um, Timothy Brown was lucky that he found this donor. It was, Timothy Brown, Brown would be in this case, and Gero Hutter found this, this case of, of a patient who was an unrelated donor with Delta 32 homozygote um, alleles. The third situation it might happen is that the transplantation can be made with an aplo identical family donor. And this is a risky situation. Uh, it might happen if you don't have any other option, but it's not the first one to choose. The fourth option would be core blood. And core blood is a very interesting option because the restrictions you need for the HLA match sibling, nine or 10 out of 10 alleles, they get reduced in the case of core blood units. In that case, you only need four out of six alleles to be identical. Therefore, the compatibility gets a little bit relaxed and you have the chance to find more potential donors if you use core blood units than if you use bone marrow from an adult uh, donor. And finally, there is a fifth situation in which we can put together these two options, in which we get blood from core blood units and we also use cells from an aplo-identical family donor. And the thing is that if we use core blood units, we normally get a limited amount of cells and those cells need to be transplanted in an adult person. Uh, most of the times, this is not enough to get an engraftment. So what we do is we complete the core blood unit with an aplo-identical family donor who will, whose cells will be transiently in the, in the recipient and they, it will go away. But it will be enough to make the engraftment happen. And I'll be telling you also about this thing. Um, what about the core blood? The core blood is a strategy that has been uh, optimized in the last years. And actually, if you look, this is, these are data from the Be The Match registry here in the United States that it gives you an idea on how these uh, core blood units are growing, not only in the States. The same graph can be found in Europe. Most of the countries in Europe, they have been accumulating units of core blood that are frozen, and they would be available for transplantation. So we have this material and we, know, we, know, we, we thought how to work with it. So I'm gonna tell you one story. And this is the story of a patient we uh, had in Barcelona and he need an allogeneic, uh, allogeneic uh, stem cell transplant. And in this case, um, he was a journalist and he was very well informed about the Berlin patient. And when he learned that he had a lymphoma, he said to his uh, hematologist, you know, I want something like Timothy Brown. I want to have something like that. So his hematology in a different hospital in Barcelona than my hospital, uh, he called me and he said, you know, Javier, I think we, we can do something here. And we started the screening of the Spanish bank uh, and the European bank and we didn't find anything, but uh, we found a Delta 32 homozygote donor in a stem site here in California, not here, but in California, in the States. And this is the story of a 37-year-old uh, man who was diagnosed with HIV in 2009 with 200 uh, uh, cells per uh, microliter around 800 copies per ml. He was immediately put on Truvada and Viramune, and he showed a good response on this treatment, but in 2011, he was diagnosed with a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and he went in chemotherapy, and he also received an allogeneic stem cell transplant. 
and he didn't respond to the transplant and then he entered the program of the um, allogeneic stem cell transplant. So this, as I told you before, I'm not an expert on animatology, but this is a summary of the conditioning that the patient received before the transplant. And the point I wanna make as well is that this is a case in which we use two things. We use the stem cell unit from core blood, but we also use cells from a third party donor. And what is gonna happen is that if you do that, after conditioning, the neutrophils of the third party donor will be transiently there and they will disappear, but they will remain enough time in the recipient to allow stem cells from the core blood unit to engraft. So that's the trick. Because otherwise, you might wanna work with two core blood units. And this is more difficult because then you need to find two compatible core blood units, okay? So that was the strategy we followed in Barcelona. And these are some of the data that, by the way, you can find this in a poster um, to, I, I, I don't remember, 432. So if you wanna go, I think this is on Tuesday, and Maria Salgado from uh, our group, she will be there um, helping you. So these are the data. Uh, so what you have in black is, um, this is a graph of the chimerism. This is telling you how much, how many of the cells from the donor and the recipient you have in the, uh, over time. And what you can find here is that you have the cells from the recipient that go away after chemotherapy. And here in gray, you have the cells from the third party donor and they go away after some time. And in red, you have the cells from the core blood units. So this was a very uh, interesting case because we use one core blood unit on day uh, zero, and then we had to use a second infusion because we realized that the cells that we got from a stem site in California, their cellularity was very low. So maybe because you know sometimes you have cells frozen for a long time or freezing conditions could not be, could not have been uh, perfect or whatever. So we need a second unit. And after the second unit, you can see that cells from uh, the core blood went up and the patient had 100% chimerism in this case. So this is a case in which we completely reconstitute the immune system. And if you look down here, this is the Delta 32, uh, and you see that here is wild type, uh, because the third party donor was a, hetero, uh, uh, a Delta 32 heterozygous. You see two bands here, two bands here, and then when the cell from the third party donor ran away, you have a complete Delta 32 by the end of the, uh, of the engraftment. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that uh, it was a relapse of the lymphoma, and this, uh, this patient passed away after uh, almost four months after the transplant with full chimerism already. Uh, data on terms, in terms of viral load is uh, telling us that this is ultra-sensitive viral load when I, when I went down, uh, during the transplant, and this is a really good sign. And if you look at different parameters, we had a really nice baseline, and, and this is something I wanna uh, stress in this, in this talk, that in, in all these studies, it's extremely important to have a good baseline of different samples. So we have provided DNA, who was detectable for, we have single copy assay in plasma and CSF, um, we have a uh, cell-associated mRNA that was also positive. We have a uh, viral outgrowth assay, infectious units per million PBMCs uh, that were uh, detectable. We had provided DNA detectable in GAD, in, uh, that was a sample from ELEON. Uh, we also had mRNA that was, in this case, was undetectable. Uh, but by provided semi-quantitative viral RNA, it was completely detectable. So if you look at a single copy assay, and this is time from transplant on, you see that single copy assay goes down, and at the very end, we could get cells and provided HIV DNA that was detectable in the baseline was completely undetectable. And if you look in provided 
DNA in CD40 cells was completely undetectable as well. Because of his stage, we couldn't get another biopsy from Ileon, as you, you might understand, but uh, we think that the whole strategy was very positive. The patient remained on treatment all the time. I want to make that very clear. So, uh, and in, in our plans was not to remove treatment in a long time, at least. Because the patient uh, passed away, we couldn't really say, well, he's been cured or not. That's, uh, it's obvious, but one thing we could do is to get cells from his blood at the very last time point and challenge those cells, CD40 cells, with virus, his own virus and also laboratory strains that we had for X4 and, and R5. And the thing that happened here is that when, ge when we get cells from other donor, that was not this one, we could infect the cells, but the patient cells were not infectable in vitro in any case. So uh, obviously this is no proof of cure at all, but it's telling us that something was working well there in terms of refraction to, uh, to viral infection. So this is one specific, one anecdotic story that you can probably sum up to the two Boston patients and to Timothy Brown as well. But because we start seeing that there are one patient here, one patient there, during those of you who were at Melbourne, you learned that there were people in Sydney that they had patients like these two. So we decided to uh, create a consortium that is being sponsored by AMFAR. And this consortium is specifically addressed to a study allogeneic stem cell transplant in HIV infected individuals. And let me tell you that this is a group of different people with different expertise. So we have in the consortium, we have people in blue, you have people, we have people that work in virology. It's our own group, group people in Utrecht and people in Hamburg. And then in red, you have people who run hematology groups in different uh, countries as well. And actually in Oxford, in the UK, there is a group who is the leading group for all the core blood banks in Europe. So they have access to all those banks and they can coordinate an action here. Um, hopefully in the next few months, we'll have also people joining from Australia. So the, the groups that found the two patients in Australia, and they were studying those patients, they will join in the group most likely uh, after the summer. And we have people also in, um, in the States, as, as I told you, uh, Timothy Henrik is in a very strong connection with us, so we try to base everything we do, we try to base it in previous experience with those people. We don't, have, we don't want to do anything new or where. We want to base something on what has been done so far. And again, the idea is to bring a complete group of people and different expertises. So where we are right now? So we started this last summer, and the commitment was to have about 10 different transplants in Europe and different countries. And this is it's not easy but because it's a coordination thing, but right now we have seven patients. Uh, out of this, there are patients who are still alive, and the idea is to follow them up in a very coordinated way. So this, this is the whole thing. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want we don't, we don't do one things, we don't want to do things in the sense that people in Germany run some tests, people in Barcelona, they run different tests, or people in England, they run different tests as well. So what we did was a guideline in which we agreed to do the same test, and we basically, uh, when one of the laboratories has to run one test, we'll do it for all the patients in Europe. So we'll transfer samples, and for instance, uh, my laboratory is responsible for ultrasensitive viremia and for IUPMs. Uh, the laboratory of Monique Nihius in Utrecht will be responsible for molecular measures, including two LTRs, uh, cell-associated RNA and DNA. Uh, for uh, T-cell immunity, we'll have the group of Jan van Lunsen in Hamburg, and each group will be specialized in a, in a very specific type of assay. Yes. Why is it that the death rate in this group seems to be so extraordinarily high? 
usually we just say 25 to 30 percent in stem cell transplant. And here it seems to be approaching 50 percent. That's a very good question, and we are still exploring that. Uh, actually, one of the groups in the consortia is trying to get the registry in Europe of all the people who have been HIV positive in the last 20 years and who at some point they need this type of transplant and see whether the um, death rate is higher in HIV infected individuals than in non HIV infected individuals. But it's true that it seems to be a little higher, although from you know, seven patients is hard to say. So that's why we are trying to you know, collect data in hundreds of people in, in Europe. And this is going to be probably ready pretty soon, this information. That's not true. You said that from the slide or? No, 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 no. We have, for instance, the two people we have in, in, in this consortium that have been the longest from uh, transplant, they're well tied for, uh, for Delta 32. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, because of the um, of the analysis of Timothy Brown, we thought that maybe chemotherapy and conditioning maybe play in a role there. But you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are aware of these two uh, pretty recent papers in which I would say that they nicely exclude the possibility that, that chemotherapy is playing at least a major role in, in this type of transplantation. But the question is st still open in how much impact has the Delta 32 transplant and how much impact has the graft versus host disease in these patients. And this is something we want to explore as well. Um, so in very recent years, they've been exploring using reduced conditioning regimens. And I'm wondering, can you, can you extrapolate you know, what might be the impact there? Because Timothy's was not reduce conditioning <laughs> by any stretch? You know, the th that's a very good question, and thank you for it. Um, the point is that, and uh, you give me the opportunity to say that very upload, is that we are not trying to cure HIV in this project, OK? Our main goal is to cure dermatological malignancy, bottom line. If on the top of that, we can learn something on HEB, fantastic. But it's not the main goal. Why I say that? Because we rely on hematologists to decide what each patient might need. They might need reduced conditioning. If they say that, fair enough. But if they think that they might need a strong, con a strong conditioning, that's fair. I mean, we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to change their minds because of the project. So we run behind then on that. That's, that's clear. Uh, so we don't have numbers to say whether reduced conditioning or strong conditioning make a difference in this setting. But what I can tell you is that we are not going to induce reduced conditioning in someone who may need a different conditioning because of the project. That's crystal clear. Following on that question, is, is Gerald Luther participating? Yes, he is. He is. He's one of the uh, collaborators, of one of the partners. Because he's done several patients after Timothy, and the outcome has not been nearly as good. Correct? Um, they were not his direct patients, that they were people who need transplantations in Europe. And uh, he's been kind of involved, but uh, not, as far as I know, he's never been taking the same approach than here. So they were not collecting samples before transplantation, and they had no um, project on how to do it. Time points, uh, deadlines, and so forth. survival of patients was not like No, I mean, all the patients who've, any single patient so far who got a Delta 32 homozygous transplantation pass away. So we don't have, and there are very few. So we don't have much data on that. And just an announcement, um, Gerald Hutzer and Timothy are going to be doing a program on Thursday evening, if you're still in town. Yeah. It's a community program. Um, they'll both be speaking. Remember, is it the library? Yeah, it's the library. It's the library. The public library a few blocks away. So that's Thursday evening. I uh, can send people the information.
Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm going to ask a, a big question, um, which you've kind of already alluded to, is we can't give people with HIV generally bone marrow transplants. How can you generalise this work? What's the pathway to turning this into a general we can, we can not do that. We cannot do that so far, but uh, I think that we might think in ways of inducing um, you know, the big problem here is, is that if you don't get chemotherapy, you don't make room for the new cells to stay there. So you always have mixed chimerism. But uh, the more we explore this option, and it's something we don't plan to do right now, but the possibility of reducing the number of T cells, autologous T cells you have in the body in someone who is not on an hematological malignancy seems to be possible, and the risk is not that high. So we're learning that, uh, but I think that before we want to understand first, is the delta 32 makes difference, or is the graft versus host or graft versus disease that makes a difference too? Well, there are ways to knock out delta 32 in the normal bone marrow. Sorry, say that again? There are ways to knock out a delta 32 gene in the normal bone marrow. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we've been doing that where we knock out the uh, delta 32 gene. Sure, sure. Bone marrow, and then we, we infuse back to that through the non myeloid conditioning regimen, which theoretically will reduce the toxicity. Yeah. Now, the caveat there is, you know, was the myeloid conditioning regimen responsible sure. for ridding him of the, you know, power reservoir? And that's a grand question that will be answered. Yeah. Yeah, great. Right. We're we're working in a couple of projects uh, by knocking down CCR5 as well. What's the approximate cost of one round of therapy? <laughs> you know, it's something I not that I cannot tell you is that I don't know it. And the Spanish system is a public system. They will cover everything. So it's something that if we have to jump into it, um, we don't care about the cost. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, in the consortium, is there any community involvement? Do you have a CAD or <laughs> we, we, um, we have a, a, one of the parts of the program is to rejoin the community in that sense. And actually, these are guidelines from the European Union, and you're probably aware of that. Uh, but this is something we haven't started yet, and we were talking with our colleagues in, in Spain about that. But we really need to get your involvement, and that, that's why I'm so happy of being here. You know, I really like your feedback and, and any ideas you might have in that sense. Javier, could you tell us about the, about the donor viruses that were able to infect his cells post-transplant? How did you characterize those viruses? What were their co-physical, what were their characteristics? Well, we use um, four types of viruses. We use lab strains. R5 and X4, and these are very infectable virus. They are really good. And then we use, from the patient itself, we use the full virus that we rescued from PBMCs before transplantation, and we use an envelope recombinant virus that we also made uh, in vitro from the same patient. Okay. 
So let me um, finish with the second part of the project, which I think this is a part that is going to give um, this project another completely another dimension. Is that, as you know, the um, prevalence of this Delta 32 mutation is not the same around the globe, worldwide. And North Europe has an allele frequency over 1%, over 10%, sorry, allele frequency, which is not genotypic frequency. Genotypic frequency is much lower. So the likelihood of having at least one allele that is Delta 32 is more, is almost 15% in North European countries, and it decreases when you go down to the south. So keeping this in mind, and I think that this is one of the reasons that AMFAR was really coming to uh, Europe for this consortium, um, um, we have this opportunity to really get into uh, populations that are very enriched in this allele. Um, you had a question? No, just the ratio between the, 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 the allele and, and homozygosity. It's, it goes from 10% to 1%. So, so you it's 10% it, lower. Yeah. It's 10% lower. So in Europe, you might find one out of 100. No question? No. So keeping this in mind, one of the things that the consortia is currently doing is that with a specific founding from AMFAR, which is, is a contract, it's not a research project, we are screening uh, the blood banks for, uh, for uh, stem cells, core blood units in London, Gothenburg, Helsinki, and Dusseldorf. And the idea is, uh, the commitment is to explore 10,000 core blood units with the hypothesis that based on the frequency, we might end it up by having two, two to 300 core blood units ready for transplant. And in Spain, with the help of the, our national transplant organization. Um, we are screening a little bit higher numbers, 22,000 core blood units in Barcelona, Malaga, and Madrid uh, with the same idea. So we increase the uh, denominator because it's South Europe, so therefore the frequency is a little lower. But the idea is that by next summer, this is ongoing now, so by next summer, we should have ready in the order of 400 to 500 core blood units for transplant. And the commitment of the banks is that those units will be blocked for HIV projects. So they will not give away to anyone. There is a European um, registry of core bloods and the commitment, uh, Bandeso Rocha in Oxford is responsible for that. It will be that they, they are gonna be used for this, this, um, uh, these studies. Yes. In Spain, it's like that, and I guess the rest of the countries in Europe, any single birth that happens in the hospital, they will collect, if the mother wants, the, the parents want, they will collect the, the, the core blood uh, for, for the registry. I, I, I cannot tell uh, off the top of my head, but I have the numbers with me, and I can tell you the, the later. Donor, right? Yeah, the thing is that, so, so the core blood bank told us that they had two potential core units, and we choose the one with greater solularity. And that was the first one we, we tried. But then when you, you are, at the time you do the transplant, you assess the solularity again. And it turned out to be much lower than the expected cellularity. So we knew that it was a second a batch. And we used it as well. And that batch had much lower cellularity. And it turned out to be higher when we uh, thaw it. So things like that happen. And one of the things we are doing in this project here, so these 30,000 core bloods, they have to fulfill a requirement of cellularity, high cellularity. Uh, think that, for instance, in Spain, we have almost 70,000 core blood units frozen, but only we're gonna test these 22,000 uh, units based on cellularity conditions.
most of those came from the cord blood or from the other donor? In, in, in the case of our patient, yes. but those cells were from the third party donor, third party donor the one that we use for, uh, for enhance the engraftment. Okay, and one thing that you probably are aware of is that there is this report that came out a couple of months or three months ago in New England Journal of Medicine in which this is a bone marrow transplant. This is uh, not a core blood transplant. It's delta-32 homozygous. And the thing here is that the uh, recipient, the HIV subject, had mostly R5 virus, but he had a small proportion of X4 viruses, and those virus uh, expand after the transplant, and actually uh, most of the virus after the transplant, he is top therapy here, and most of the virus rebounding here, they were X4 tropic, and most of the virus rebounding here, they were also X4 tropic. So this is, again, a case in which we have to really think about uh, do a strong CCR5 testing before transplant. But, you know, I don't think we have many more options. I mean, if a patient comes tomorrow and he has a small amount of R5, but he still needs a transplant, what we're going to do? I think that our option would be if we have a Delta 32 ready for transplant, we'll use it because there are not many more options to do in that case. So I'm going to finish by leaving you with open considerations. What is best, using Aplocore versus classical allogeneic stem cell transplant? Which conditioning is the best? Conditioning of patients without malignancies, is it feasible, feasible to do that or not? What the best antiretroviral therapy? And I have to say that in the patient we had in Barcelona, we switch therapy from nefirapine to raltegravir because we wanted to reduce interactions between uh, chemotherapy and antiretroviral uh, treatment. How much immunosuppression is needed? How much graft versus host or graft versus disease is necessary? And at this point, I want to tell you that the consortium works in a way that we are happy to get external contributions. And one of at least two of the contributions we have so far in the last two months, one is from a group who really are interested in understanding the role that the thymus plays in the maturation of the new CD40 cells. And the second group that has applied for collaboration is a group that really think that NK cells, they do play a role in graft versus disease. So we are very open, as long as we have enough cells and material, we're very open to collaboration. What's the best uh, uh, way of in interrupting therapy, the best analytical treatment interruption, and ethical considerations? So if we can discuss all, any of these topics, I'll be happy of. Um, just uh, to finish, I want to thank um, Amford and all the people at the uh, Epistem project. Uh, my co-chair in this uh, group is Anne-Marie Wensim from Utrecht, but we have a number of people, uh, hematologists, virologists, and, and blood bankers that are really uh, doing a great job in different countries in Europe. And um, more locally, I think uh, I have to thank uh, people in our oncology institute in Barcelona, our blood bank in Barcelona, and my own institution, all their effort, especially to Maria Salgado, who is doing a great job uh, in this project in terms of coordination and science as well. And thank you for your attention. Not yet. Yeah. We want to understand exactly what role is playing the thymus in this, uh, in this setting. And maybe after that, we might think about that. And I think that we, we're going to get nice information in terms of stratifying also people different ages and see how the thymus is working in different, in different people. But I think it's too early to say whether we can use growth hormone or not. Steve? I think one of the other key things about uh, Timothy Brown was he went off antiretroviral therapy during the, um, the transplant. Yeah, we, we thought a lot about that with Gero because he's in the group 
and we met also Dan Kuritskes uh, in, um, in uh, Europe. And we, we discussed this point, and we do believe that the risk is too high. I think that we can, we can envision a situation in which you can do the, the transplantation in the setting of maintaining antiretroviral treatment and take it out later on. But I don't see, maybe, uh, maybe someone in the room has a different view, but I don't see any benefit of stopping antiretroviral therapy that I can imagine in the sense that engraftment is going to be better. You have any idea on that? Or? Because we thought a lot about that. And maybe in the case of Timothy Brown, that happened by chance. Uh, but I don't see whether, I see more risk than benefits on a stopping antiretroviral therapy during transplantation. That's. I think that, you know, um, this is data that we have not published yet, but the people who has been now for more than a year after transplant with Delta 32, sorry, with, with CCR5 wild type, not Delta 32, in um, one of them, they have no sign of virus at all. Amazing, anything we look at is white, there's nothing there. But in the other patient, with the same time, about the same procedure, we find virus. So I think that the only way I would go for ATI would be in someone who really has nothing clear there. But if you find proviral DNA or you have low viral level viremia in plasma, I wouldn't do it. No, some of the patients had, yeah. Uh, not all of them, but again, this is, this is a decision that dermatologists might want to take by themselves, but some of them they had, some of them they didn't. I would just make a comment on the chemotherapy issue, because one of the original infusional chemotherapy regimens that Rich Little pioneered, he stopped therapy in those patients. This is a bone marrow transplant, this is the chemotherapy for primary NHL, and he had a very high cure rate, 70%, and thought that the drugs may be interfering with the efficacy of the therapy regimen. So there is some argument that when the AMC did a follow-on trial to validate that, it actually left it up to the individual colleges whether or not to stop chemo, um, antiviral therapy during chemotherapy. So there's still a question, I think, of the interaction of things. The withdrawal technology is a little cleaner, but it's still an open, there are open questions in addition to making space, you know, allowing those cells to be wiped out by HIV to create space for new cells. There's other issues, I think, that are still yep. I, I know that uh, the last patient, we have three more people that are going to be transplanted in the next two months. So the last one who was transplanted uh, 15 days ago, he had to stop antiretroviral therapy for a brief period, I think three or four days during the transplant because the pharmacologist thought that it could be interaction with the chemotherapy. But this has been, this has been just one out of seven that happened. In the rest of them, they, they could keep the antiretroviral therapy. And you made a good point, and I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's uh, some benefit. Any other question? Thank you very much. Thank you. I have to say thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate the invitation, and I hope that it'll be informative. Uh, I'm uh, a director of uh, discovery virology at Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm re uh, responsible for our basic research program in uh, HIV uh, remission cure uh, research. Um, and what I'm going to tell you today are, are some things that I presented in other forums, and it might be somewhat familiar to some of you, but maybe not to all of you. I'll stick uh, somewhat to the science, but as Javier uh, uh, did at the end of his talk, he asked some, some questions that I touched on actually at a presentation that I gave at the NIH uh, earlier uh, or uh, in the fall. 
Um, and so I will just uh, uh, proceed then. And uh, so we've, we've talked a lot about cure in various uh, situations and, and the, the, the fact that sterilizing cure and functional cure might be uh, t uh, two very different uh, things. I like to think of it as maybe viral eradication and virologic remission to make it a little bit of a, of a, of a more defined goals where viral eradication really does require the elimination of all the virus from the body. And I think that this is an incredibly high bar to achieve and might only actually be achievable through some of the means that, uh, that, that Javier was, was talking about and, and because of the, the things that Timothy Brown went through um, in his two transplants that he ha uh, had to uh, undergo. Uh, so it's an extremely high bar, whereas virologic remission could be defined as the host control of viral replication without continued treatment, continued antiviral th treatment, uh, restoration of, um, uh, or stabilization of immune function, reduced inflammation, as, as Javier touched on also, and it's uh, something that uh, I'll touch on later. And one of the important things is a reduced risk of transmission to uh, others. Um, it might be difficult to achieve those goals as well, but I just think that, that the virologic remission, at least for certain periods of time, might be achievable uh, or at least more feasible. But really our ultimate goal is, is to have a lifelong or, or what you could say is completely drug-free remission. And, and the question is, of course, how do we, how do we get there? And what I'll discuss today is some of the combinations of, of therapies, and I'll emphasize that these are, are uh, uh, therapeutic interventions that are, uh, are drugs or biologics, and uh, I'll, I'll not be discussing any of the gene or cell-based therapies in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, but I will touch on several different possible combinations, which could be uh, including uh, some of the things that you've that uh, Javier also touched on, and I'm glad that to be following Javier because he gave a very nice introduction. Uh, sorry for the uh, barriers to eradication, which I left out, but I'm alluding back to his presentation to suggest that some of these might be involved in in um, uh, surmounting some of those barriers, such as immunomodulators enhancing adaptive or innate immunity. Therapeutic vaccine might be re required to uh, bring different antigens to, uh, to bear um, and uh, latency and activators, people have talked about this quite a lot, about uh, reactivating the latent reservoir and the implications that that might have for uh, uh, HIV remission. And then a new, one of the new ones, uh, new kids on the block are the neutralizing or broadly neutralizing antibodies that may or may not be a component of, of, of this scenario. But basically, um, where I'm going to go start is anchoring this talk on anti pdl one because we've done a, a few studies with this and are presently uh, working on, on this as uh, a basis for uh, additional combinations. So I'll give you a brief introduction of, of PD-L1, uh, PD PDL1 axes, and this is a pathway that's intimately involved in uh, virus uh, uh, T-cell exhaustion, a response to, to virus, but also is evident in, in oncological indications. And it's actually, uh, um, although a lot of the work that validated PD-1, PD-L1 pathway was done early on in chronic viral infections, it's very much been pioneered in, in therapies in onco oncologic indications. So I'll stick to uh, virology in this case. Um, and just re-emphasize that, that virus-specific T cells are, are actually critical to uh, control of chronic viral, uh, viral infections. And the PD-1 uh, uh, is a key in inhibitory receptor that's expressed on, on T cells. And it's, it, it's, it's actually elevated in chronic viral infections in HIV, HBV, HCV. Uh, and as well as some bacterial, uh, chronic bacterial infections. There was a very nice paper that appeared recently from uh, Jeppe Pantelion's group uh, that uh, uh, showed this very, very nicely uh, for certain indication in bact uh, chronic bacterial infection. It's expressed often in both C CD4, CD8 subsets. And these cells explain an exhausted phenotype. That is, uh, and I'll touch on this on a later slide, but actually involves 
uh, being unable to secrete the cytokines that are necessary for its function, not able to proliferate, and uh, basically could involve deletion of those cells if they actually go towards a apoptosis. And what, ha what we know is also that on epitope escape, for instance, if, if, there's, uh, if, that, if the T cell is no longer uh, able to be functional on certain epitopes because the virus is mutated, or in the stake of control of, uh, of infection on antiretrovirals, they, the, 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 these uh, signals actually decrease. But that's because in this case, this, this T cell might not be functional anymore in the context of controlling the chronic viral infection. So blockade of PD, uh, PD-1, PD-L1, and that can be uh, accomplished either using antibodies against PD-1 or PD-L1, actually have been shown both are in vitro and in vivo, and I'll touch on, on some of the in vivo experiments, to reinvigorate T cells and allow them to uh, restore their function. And that's, the function is actually a, a, a virus-specific function. That is that it's, these are virus-specific T cells, and they, and they are now able to react to those, that virus and to uh, secrete the cytokines and have cytotoxic effects. Uh, yes? The ligand is expressed on, it's quite ubiquitous actually, PDL1. PDL2 is a second ligand. It's actually expressed somewhat specifically on antigen presenting cells, in particular DC. It's actually known as uh, B7DC. Um, and also on other uh, macrophage like cells. It's actually PDL1 that's believed to uh, be involved in the uh, um, uh, exhaustion phenotype more so because it's probably more ubiquitously expressed. It's unknown, but it's, it, PD-L1 can be expressed on T cells. Yeah, both CD4 and CD8 as well. So um, there are some in vivo uh, evidence uh, that was a very, very uh, nice study done by uh, Amara and uh, Velu and uh, Ahmed, Afi Ahmed where they used uh, a, a PD-1 antibody to uh, test in uh, SIV-infected macaques that were not on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. And this just summarizes the results from those experiments where, at least in some situations, not in all, but in some, the uh, administration of, of anti-PD-1 actually helped reduce viral load somewhat. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a huge uh, de reduction but, or sustained, but it was a reduction. It actually did increase T cell function in the sake of, uh, sense of polyfunctionality, and that is where it's able to produce, the T cell it goes from being able to produce only a single cytokine to, present, to producing more than one cytokine, preferably triple, three, three different cytokines that are important to function. And in this particular study, they were actually able to monitor survival because some of the animals were infected with a particularly pathogenic form of SIV virus that actually does uh, result in AIDS-like uh, 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 symptoms and actually uh, the animals can succumb. And it was shown that the administration antibody in, this, in these cases uh, prolonged survival quite dramatically. So, we had this evidence already from uh, this, uh, this, pre this paper from 2009, and we were w working on the other side of the uh, axes, PD-L1, uh, and we also thought that we, we would like to know what happens in the case of uh, virologic suppression with antiretrovirals, because this is obviously uh, a, a more therape a therapeutically relevant situation for HIV-infected patients. Mm -hmm. yes. What is alpha-PD-1? Is that Oh, sorry, it, it's just a symbol for anti. Sorry, I, I, I sometimes use that uh, interchangeably with the word I don't anti. The single, double, triple the, this is different cytokine functions that ah. the T cells can express. And so when a, when a T cell is exhausted, it's exhausted, it might not be able to proliferate, might not be able to express as many cytokines as it needs for its function. And in this case, the, the T cells were able to actually ex express more and more of this panel of cytokines that are necessary for its function. What do you think is the predictability of this model in humans in terms of the we, we can talk about that after um, uh, I present some of my data. And uh, it's, it's always a, an important question. Whenever you talk about animal models, that it, that it needs to be addressed, if you don't mind. All right. 
So, oh, sorry, one more question. So just as a general request, can you please speak up because we can hardly hear anything here in the back. Can you hear me? Not just you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, but I couldn't hear that previous question. She was at, she, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll try and repeat the question. She was asking about the uh, relevance of the animal model to the human situation. Right. All right, so. In, in our case, this is a collaboration with uh, Dr. James Whitney at uh, Beth Israel uh, uh, Deaconess uh, Medical Center in uh, Boston. He's also cross-pointed to the Ragon and Harvard. Um, we wanted to test the, the situation using anti pdl one blockade in ARV-suppressed uh, SIV-infected uh, macaques. And our hypothesis was based on the previous study where they showed that there was a, a restoration of this uh, SIV-specific T cell function. And we felt that this might actually lead to some reductions in the latent SIV reservoir and or lead to uh, host control of the virus upon treatment interruption. The study design was that we uh, recruited previously infected animals, put them onto uh, a cocktail of ARVs, uh, 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 carried out that ARV suppression for a period of about six months on, on, on average, administered blockade of the antibody, and in this case, we had a control of an isotype and uh, control antibody that's just an antibody that has the same uh, makeup of the, of the, as, as the antibody that was used, and the antibody that was used was specifically BMS 936559, which is anti pd one and this is an IgG4, and the control is similar is an IgG4 control. And then after a period of time, we took the animals off of antiretroviral therapy and watched their rebound of, vir of uh, virus. Um, and the objectives, as I alluded to up here, were uh, to determine whether these, the, these doses of anti pdl one and I'm sorry if I'm standing in people's way, uh, was associated with uh, or, or uh, was, would, could be associated with any changes in the viral reservoir or affect the recrudescence or the rebound of virus on treatment interruption. And so we were very interested in, in the treatment interruption phase and I'll focus on, on that uh, phase of the study. And this is all of the viral loads of all the animals. I know it's quite a mess, uh, and, but I'll, I'll break it down for you in, 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 in a little bit more detail. The red uh, lines are the isotype control, that is the antibody that's irrelevant to anti pdl one or, or to pdl one And the blue lines are, are, are those animals treated with anti pdl one BMS 936559. And you can see that, that there's something going on. There's some animals that, that, that have different viral loads in there. Uh, what first, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just point out that all of the animals experienced a rebound of, uh, of virus post-treatment uh, interruption. And then after a period of time, almost all of them did stabilize at some set point, we can call it. Um, and I'm not going to emphasize the, those points, but I'll go to the individual load, viral loads of the treated uh, of the anti pdl one treated group, you can sort of start to see that there's two different sets of, of animals. There's these ones here that looked a lot like the red lines. They actually looked very similar to the isotype controls. And then there's these animals here that, in fact, some of the animals seem to go to undetectable and rebound back and forth, but stay relatively low compared to the uh, these other animals or the isotype uh, control group. So we call these ones treatment responders, BMS 936559 responders, uh, I'll just say 559 for short from now on, or treatment non-responders. So if you take away the treatment non-responder group and just look at the, uh, at the 559 treatment respond, response group, you can see again all of the animals rebounded. Some of them actually did achieve undetectable viral loads. There were two animals that had relatively long prolonged viral loads of three and four weeks, and this animal actually achieved undetectable at different periods. A third animal actually achieved undetectable at two consecutive uh, time points, but we didn't have time points in between to uh, understand whether they were rebounding in between. So there were three animals that had episodic periods of undetectable viral load. And this is just the two animals that had the, the most prolonged effect. You can really see that they were undetectable for several different uh, time points uh, when we were um, testing the animals quite intensely. 
And they actually remained under uh, a, a, just a, uh, an arbitrary cutoff that we placed as 1,000, viral load of 1,000, for the entire length, rest of the length of the study, which was 170 days uh, after treatment interruption, uh, pretty much uh, over six months. So this is, was uh, quite exciting to us. Um, in addition, we did comparisons of pre-ART and post-treatment uh, post viral loads. And uh, this is the, uh, the 559 treated group. This is their actual pre-ARV. This was way back before they actually started on, on ARV. And this is actually their set, what we thought was their set point. It was based on two or three viral load determinations and is a, 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 a mean of that. And you can see that at that period that was shortly after treatment interruption, most all of the animals had a decline. In fact, all of the treatment animals declined. And the ones that are in the dark open symbols are those that are that treatment response group. They had the greatest uh, decline compared to the pre-ARV set point. And although there was like a decrease in most of these animals here, they didn't really look like this. This was up to four logs viral load decline. Now, there, there, um, and there is actually one animal that uh, we lost in this group afterwards, so some of the data actually only has four instead of five animals. After, when you actually do the median of almost the entire rest of the experiment, up to 170 days, you can see that, that the treatment response group, as you can see in the other viral load exper um, slide, does start to go up. Um, there are some that go up and some go, that go down, but it's just a, a, a matter of the fluctuations of, of the viral loads. And there's this animal here in the, in the isotype group that actually goes down. It's actually a type of, uh, has, a, has a haplotype, of, uh, MHC haplotype, that's not uh, dissimilar to some of the elite controller haplotypes in humans and actually uh, viral load did actually go to undetectable, but only very late in the, in the study. One important thing was to look at the, at the proviral DNA, and this was, our, or what we'd like to say is the rate latent reservoir. Sure, yes. Yeah, if I can just ask you for a second. Okay, do you want me to go back? Sorry, I didn't emphasize that. They received five, five doses over a two-week period, uh, pretty much twice, twice a week. They were all on ART that through the period where they received the anti pdl one So six weeks from the start of administration of PD-L1. And sorry, I guess you asked when, when after ART? When after the PD-L1? Yeah. After the, the start of PDL1, it was six weeks, so out four weeks after the treatment period the ended. Isotype consistently the isotype was, a, was an irrelevant antibody that has the same, same backbone okay. antibody structure. Okay. So one treatment regimen, five? Five doses in this case, yeah. And we did that because this is a human antibody in monkeys. Uh, there's a lot of detail about why to do that, but we anticipated that there would be an antibody reaction to, the, to that, and we felt that at two weeks we could get a maximal effect, uh, of, and we actually do have data that suggests that the pharmacokinetics of the antibody over this period was maintained, and that the receptors that it binds, PD-1, PD were bound during that two weeks, but actually not after that because of anti-drug antibody effects. But that's a lot of details that uh, are additional. What was the dosing? How many MIGs per kg? 10 MIGs per kg. Yeah. So it, they, they effectively received, uh, they, they effectively received uh, five doses of, of 10 MIG per kg. So it was, I would have to do the calculation of per kilogram. We just throw it out that they're 10, but they're actually between seven and eight kilograms each. So if you wanted to figure it out. Right. In monkeys, uh, we, we consider a chronic infection after um, at, at they've been infected for at least 70 days, approximately. That's when there starts to be changes that might reflect uh, chronicity. And the viral load is actually already at a set. If they aren't 
administered ARV at that point. The viral load is at a set point. Um, their, their CD4 count has decreased and come up slightly, but will start to decrease again. These sort of characteristics that are not unlike humans and gets to the question, the rel the question of relevance of the model. And, and are there levels of exhaustion? Like, can you say within one, like in, in a population, like one is, like, were those animals where you had a very good response here to the, to the molecule, were they more exhausted? It's, it's hard to say. There were differences in, in, some, of, in some of those parameters, and uh, we'll discuss those in, when, in a paper when, we, when we're publishing this. So he, he was asking, uh, what, were there any differences in parameter of the chronicity of the infection for the animals that responded versus those that, that did not respond? And I was suggesting that we'll give some evidence of some of those uh, kind of parameters in, when we publish this uh, later this year. All right. So if there's no more questions, I'll proceed. So we looked at the proviral DNA uh, as a marker of, uh, of the latent reservoir. It's argued that it's not a great re marker of the, of the viral reservoir because it represents all uh, DNA, whether it's uh, dead virus or active virus. But um, be that as it may, it's, it, it provides at least a marker of, uh, of uh, the latent reservoir. And we looked at PBMCs, colon, and lymph nodes. This is just showing the uh, total SIV DNA in the colon and PBMC. And what we found is the animals, uh, I'll start with the red animals. These are, again, the isotype controls. The um, proviral DNA pre-antibody, pre-TI, that's still uh, um, in that six-week period before they were released, and uh, post-TI, and this was, I think, several weeks after the, the, the uh, or several months even after the treatment interruption. We compared this, this parameter in these, in these different tissues, compartments, and what we can see is that, for the most part, the, the SIV, total SIV DNA goes up in the isotype control. There are animals where this happens in the treated group, the 559 treated group, but in the animals that are the treatment response group, those that are in open symbols, and I circled in gold here, they're amongst this group where it sort of stayed the same. It didn't decrease, but it didn't go up. And I think this provides something of a clue of what might have been going on. And it might be that uh, the um, uh, SIV-specific T cells may have been able to actually maintain this uh, latent pool at a certain level and that's why we didn't see this, this rebound of, of virus in those, uh, or this maintenance of, of a suppression over a, um, a longer period in the response animals. So this is just uh, to highlight the main point of the study, that is that the, uh, uh, after treatment of the, uh, with anti pdl one we did see this, this suppression a viral load in a certain percentage of the monkeys. It was actually 50% of the monkeys, uh, four of eight. What we'd like to know is basically how can we get this post anti pd one uh, treatment response or eight post ATI response <coughs> expanded and sustained. That's going to give us our measure of remission that I was alluding to at the, at the beginning. So again, this is the, the, the potential combinations. Uh, and it, with anti pd one we could see different uh, combinations with any of these different uh, um, regimens. And there is some evidence from the literature that, that some of these might work. Or uh, we may actually want to question whether anti pd one is the right uh, molecule at all. And maybe some of the, uh, some of the combinations that going this way might actually be the more appropriate combinations. So one of the possibilities is we might be able to address um, exhaustion more completely. PDL1 and PD1 are not the only exhaustion markers. There's actually uh, from, and it was addressed in this uh, review by uh, John Wary, that there are several markers of, uh, <laughs> of exhaustion in, in a chronic viral infection setting that go, uh, go on to uh, provide a potentially more exhausted phenotype. And, it, and it's possible that, um, I will skip just some of these uh, points for uh, brevity, that maybe multiple checkpoints need to be blockaded 
to sustain that, uh, that response. So that's one of the possibilities. Here's some evidence for anti pdl one and therapeutic vaccines. Uh, this is a, mo a mouse model of chronic, uh, of chronic uh, viral infection, the so-called LCMV uh, mouse, mouse model. And this is an experiment done again by the uh, Rafi Ahmed lab where they used uh, either a vaccine that's specific to a, a, a particular epitope of the virus, PDL1, or a combination of both. And either looking at serum viral load or viral loads in different tissues, uh, they actually had quite a profound response, particularly in certain tissues, of when they treated with both PDL1 and the therapeutic vaccine together. So this could be giving us a, a significant um, a clue as to what might be necessary to get the sustained response. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's the broadly neutralizing antibodies, and this is an experiment that was from uh, the Baruch lab. Uh, my uh, collaborator, uh, James Whitney, was also a, a, an author on this paper, where they treated viremic animals. Yes? Do you know what would happen if you gave the pdl one antibody over a longer period of time? Uh, we're actually uh, testing that hypothesis. So that's, yeah, even one of the other simpler solutions. Because the, because the antibody is a human antibody, we, had, we have to do some things to the antibody to be able to test that hypothesis. It's a, excuse me, it's a little bit off topic, but um, based on the previous slide, is, especially with the combination of uh, pdl one and the um, vaccine, is how much of these um, restored uh, CD4 cells are giving help to the new cell lineage? Mm. And how much that might be helping to reduce virus. Mm -hmm. um, is there any sense of that at all? In therapeutic vaccines in particular? Well, the combination. Yeah. Because, you know, you had a previously... That's a really good question, and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Uh, maybe Afim will be able to address some of that, because he's talking about the, the follicular, follicular centers, and that's intimately involved in uh, the probably a lot of what's going on in, in these responses. And in particular, uh, the follicular centers seem to be the, the source possibly of, of uh, the latent reservoir and also might hold a key to why sometimes the, the uh, T cells can't get at these latent reservoirs in those centers and also is a source of some of the B cell help that you're alluding to. So this is, I, I couldn't actually answer your question, on, but. It's, it's a very complex uh, uh, question, but it's a good one. Yes. A, a similar sort of question, but in the anti-DLA <coughs> and experiments you did before, mm -hmm. you looked at, at cells in there, you looked at stem cells. Yep. I was curious on how much of that effect you could just be due to the entire toxicity, specifically on not just T cells, but macrophage and T cells. Cytotoxicity how? It's, it's possible because it's, uh, it's a human antibody in a, in a mixed system. We don't think it's related to that uh, because the effect was so prolonged and the antibody was basically gone after the first two weeks of administration uh, because of these anti-drug anti antibody effects. I find it less likely to be that than restoring some cellular immune functions. And we are actually exploring that hypothesis at presently by looking at, uh, at markers of T cell function and also phenotypic analysis of the T cells. But it's always a possibility in a mixed system. Okay. So quickly, the broadly neutralizing antibodies, this is an experiment that they, test, they treated, in this case, envelope shiv monkeys. These are a mixed HIV envelope in an SIV background to allow them to test the human uh, or the anti-HIV antibodies in this context. And really the, the unexpected result in this is, is that some of the animals in this treatment regimen actually didn't rebound after this initial treatment with the broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's 
maybe hypothesize like what, what was being asked there that there was an effector function in this case against the, the latent reservoir cells. Uh, and I don't know whether, I think that some of their follow-up experiments are exploring this possibility. And some of these antibodies are actually being tested in uh, uh, HIV-infected subjects. And uh, additional experiments that I won't go into the details. And then there's the last hypothesis, and that's the activation of the latent reservoir. There's been many human studies already testing this hypothesis with various HDAC inhibitors, in particular Saha has been quite intensely studied, other HDAC inhibitors, such as romadepsin in this case, and I'm sorry if I, I, I think I, oh, you can see it labeled, I should have put it on a bit bigger. This is the romadepsin study from the Danish group where uh, they were looking at the effect of uh, three administrations of romadepsin on viral rebound. They want to actually go on and test it in the combination with therapeutic vaccines. I think that study's ongoing. In this case, what's interesting is they actually did see blips of plasma viremia, uh, although it was inconsistent over the course of the experiment. But what, what was exciting about when they showed this is that the, uh, this is actually the first time that people have actually seen real viral load blips in the context of a latency reactivator using a standard uh, viral load determination assay. And this was with, uh, I believe, a, a COBOS or a, um, actually it was, a, a, yeah, it was a COBOS there. And we and others are, are screening for uh, and characterizing po potential new latency reactivation agents. And I hope to be able to tell you uh, about some of those uh, findings of ours uh, later on. So this is our model for what we believe happened in the, the, in the case of, yeah. Just one question. Do you envision any interaction between HDAC inhibitors and anti-PD1 or because Interaction. it's a from Broch Walter saying that, that HDAC inhibitors may mm -hmm. reduce HLA presentation. Yeah. So this is one of the problems with any time you're working with a drug is you have to be cognizant of all the effects of the drug. And HDAC inhibitors do seem to be having this negative effect. That's why we're looking for other types of latency reactivators that may or may not have these or hopefully won't have these sort of effects. And so it might actually limit the usefulness of HDAC inhibitors because of that. So the, 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 the it was, uh, to again reiterate for people that couldn't hear the question maybe, is there, there has been evidence that HDAC inhibitors actually can impair T cell function uh, in some cases and may not actually be um, very um, conducive to what we want to actually accomplish. They might actually uh, be able to cause the latent reservoir to be expressed, but if you're actually killing the T cells or, or, or suppressing their function, you're actually probably defeating the purpose. I, I agree, and, but I'll get to the, my, what I hypothesize and how maybe we need to get around that in a moment. And it's actually in, on this in the next slide. So um, what, what we feel is happening in, in the SIV study, going back to that, is that treatment with anti-PD-L1 was able to restore the SIV-specific antigen uh, function. And this, these, new, these restored functional T cells were able to attack and maybe get rid of the latent reservoir cells that actually are spontaneously expressing the latent reservoir, expressing virus from the latent reservoir. But of course, this is a rather stochastic thing. It doesn't happen. Uh, uh, it is rather spontaneous. It's a matter of if the T cell that the virus is latent in is actually activated by antigen for the, for the most part. So you can see that there's only a few of the latent reservoir cells that might be expressing virus at any one time. And so that's where you, where you only get a partial reduction of uh, infected cells and an incomplete response like we saw in our monkey study. Uh, maybe if I could just go on and then it might actually answer your question. So what we feel is that combination, and this is my favorite hypothesis right now, combination with a strong latency activator that doesn't have the negative impact of perhaps some of the HDAC inhibitors in affecting T cell function, combined with treatment with anti pdl one would both restore the SIV or HIV specific T cell function, would actually increase the level of expression of the latent virus on the latent reservoir cells, and that's key. If you're actually getting virus produced, like those blips in the romadepsin, you're hopefully expressing these on the cells, 
and they have to be expressed in the ap appropriate context of MHC to actually for the T cell to attack those cells and, and destroy them. This might actually lead to a more uh, dramatic reduction of the latent reservoir and potentially broader responses that could lead to uh, prolonged remissions. Yeah. Do you think that in the situation of a chronic HIV infection in humans, mm -hmm. there are enough HIV specific uh, cells left right. or are they clonally deleted? Or in SIV, it, it's been hypothesized that they're not. Uh, sorry, in HIV, I'm sorry, I'm on S SIV, it, it, they are probably not clonally deleted. They're not exhausted to that extent, and there's been lots of in vitro studies that have shown that they are actually still there. And um, so it's, it's probably the case that they're still there. They might actually be against epitopes that are not, no longer relevant because the virus has mutated. There actually it was a, a recent study in, published in uh, Nature uh, just recently that suggested those epitopes, not in HIV context, but in uh, oncology context, might still be relevant if you can restore function, functional uh, recognition of those epitopes. So I know it didn't completely answer your question. I think that they're still there and they still might be relevant if you restore their function. And sorry, did that answer your question or did you have another question? I have a more basic question. Sure. I don't, I don't like to, I didn't refer to it as program cell death because I think that is alluding to a downstream function that, like you were sort of alluding to as well, it, it's, it's more a marker of first activation and then exhaustion. PD, and, and it was on a, cell, uh, on a slide I didn't, didn't go over. But just conceptually, if it's a marker for exhaustion and you're blocking it, yeah. No, it, I, this, is, this is actually getting at exactly what you're asking, and I skipped over it for the sake of brevity, but I hope I'm not taking up too much of time. So the, the, it's a very important question because in, in an infection, in an, in an acute infection, and usually when you refer to acute infection, it's a type of viral infection that's normally clear, flu virus, uh, these, these sort of things. It's very important to control T cell function so that it doesn't go wild. So anti, uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 axes, along with a couple of other of uh, these types of exhaustion markers, are actually involved in tuning down the initial T cell response that occurs in response to an acute infection. So they are actually markers of, of T cell activation first, and in this context only, because they dampen down the effect. You get all these functions, the T cells clear out the infected cells, and everybody's happy. In the case of chronic infection, what happens is, and in the case of HIV, it's, it's still, you know, it's a very dynamic system. It's affecting the uh, several markers that could lead to the complete loss of the T cells. But what happens is there's this persistent viremia, persistent anagenemia, the, these are signals that keep the, the T cells activated to some extent, and so PD-1 stays expressed on those cells. And, this, and as a consequence, they start to lose function. Now, it might not be PD-1 itself that's responsible for the eventual cell death. It might be several of these markers that might need to be expressed on any particular T cell that eventually leads to this depletion of that, of that. So I think it's a bit of a boondoggle that it's called program cell death, because that's where the original phenotype that it was observed, it's actually first an activation marker in acute infections, then it's an exhaustion marker, then it's a cell death marker. All right? I know we have more questions. So how, how much more do you have? I'm gonna just go, I have one, one important slide, and I'm just gonna skip over this one just to highlight that um, where, where I wanted to go with the next, next, next slides is important for the discussion, and that's what is a state that we might be able to get to that might be of benefit to patients, um, but not, might not be that complete remission. And 
we have several examples in real, real life of different levels of, of spontaneous suppression, viremic suppressors, elite controllers, of course even art suppressed patients where they're at a state where you could say they're actually in remission, right? Except they need the drugs continually to be on that remission. And then there's still this, this inflammation that goes on that actually is also responsible for such a, some of the comorbidities. So the question is, although we want to eventually get to a state where we have complete remission, I don't think we can get there with one thing or two things, and it's going to take a little while, and we need to be able to figure out what that is. So in the meantime, is there a state that can approximate ther therapeutically one of these states that might be of benefit, one of these controller-like states that might be worthwhile? And so I've already highlighted that I think we'll require combination of modalities, and this is the question, is, this, is, is an intermediate goal uh, of, to be able to find these correct combinations uh, necessary on the way to complete remission. So is there, is there such an intermediate state and what would it look like basically? So would low level yet detectable viremic state be sufficient for certain periods of time? Shorter periods of drug-free remission at undetectable levels for instance instead of viremic state or combination? If there was redosing of, of, aid, of an agent that was necessary, for instance, anti pdl one every certain period, it's not the best scenario because you're just replacing one drug, drug regimen with another. But in the interim, is it something that is acceptable? And lastly, we, feel, we, we know that inflammation is important and it needs to be reduced, but like you, you had mentioned in the beginning of your talk, and I like the way you put it, is it a consequence or is it a cause of, of the chronic state that we're in, and the, and the cause for uh, latent virus in the beginning. So if you actually end up either eliminating the latent reservoir, do you address inflammation? And maybe that is something that we could ask. And I'm sorry for taking so long, but there are so many good questions. Um, that's basically it. I'd just like to finish with some acknowledgments. Most importantly, other than the people on this slide who actually contributed to work and ideas, I, I really want to thank you, all of you, the subjects in trials that are, are going to volunteer for these uh, trials that uh, are putting yourselves at risk, and all the people that contributed to the work that uh, I highlighted um, throughout the years. So I think there was a question back there first. I, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but how low? Like, because even at suppressed, we're still viremic, right? At, at, in a SCA, you can detect around two to four maybe uh, copies per ml. When you calculate the number of virions that is per body, it's still a huge amount. Well, but you're, you're, you're actually non infectious, is what, yeah, what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the key. So, I think we need to do on it. yeah. Yeah, and that's why I brought the, brought the question up, is it's important to get input on that. Uh, I don't know who was next. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, we'll go back and forth. How about that? Um, I find this really interesting, and thanks for the first explanation of PD-1 I've ever actually understood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've done a lot of work writing about um, Louis Picker's CMV. Beautiful work. Incredible and work. It strikes me that this could be really complementary to that if they if they worked in synergy with each other. This could be a kind yeah. of synergy with that one because that broadens the immune responses to HIV and yeah. this, this could sort of perpetuate them. Mm -hmm. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there is a broader question which you brought up at the end about whether we want in a cure to um, <clears throat> Uh, induce uh, uh, a kind of continued state of mild inflammation which is very vi vigilant against the yeah, virus yeah, or yeah, whether yeah, we want yeah. to suppress it. Yeah. And I, PD-1 is really interesting because it kind of, as you pointed out, it does both mm. at different parts of the cellular life cycle. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's, 
a lot to investigate there. It also reminded me um, of the CMV vaccine in, in that the 50% mm -hmm. response rate yeah. is yeah. quite mysterious, and that right. was the case with Louis Picker's vaccine too. Yeah. Uh, and so finding out why mm -hmm. you have non-responders is clearly going to be the major part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting work. Thank you. Did you find any predictor of responders? We haven't yet. We're still looking. We're doing a lot of experiments to try and determine that. I think we were going to go on this side. Sorry. Uh, actually, I think you were next. It may be unfair because you're working for Bristol Myers, but is there any difference if you block PD-1 or PD-1L? It's not unfair because we have both anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1. <laughs> <laughs> I know that also. <laughs> yeah, we, we really feel that, that blocking one or the other is, very, is going to work very similarly. There are subtle differences physiologically between the two in, in what they might be blocking. And, and our experts that we consulted really felt that they were somewhat equivalent. And we were in the advantage of having both. The oncology, the reason why you were probably getting at the question, maybe why PDL1 in this. So the, the, the rationale there was that PD1 was so far in the clinic in, in oncology, it, it was, there were so many clinical trials, and yet we had PDL1. If they're equivalent, we went with PDL1. It was just business decision. Back in the back. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I mean, first of all, bring more light on the optimal time between the last two of us to do one. Sorry, I, I, you're going to have to speak up, sorry. Uh, I mean, just a knowing time, the question is throw more light on the optimal time of the last dosing of PD1 and the rebound time. Right. And uh, secondly, uh, after the rebound time, do you have some clinical intervention to see if it is better to restart with PD-1 or combination therapy or both? Uh, first question, we just picked a time that I felt was necessary to establish a T-cell functional effect, and that's why we ended on that with the SIV uh, study. I really don't know how long it's going to take and we're going to have to look for biomarkers of response that are going to be able to tell us what would be optimal to be able to safely take people off. And that's getting at your second question is, is I think that in an AT, you were asking about ATIs, was it? Um, yeah. So how do you do safe ATIs is a big question. And um, it's a bit beyond my expertise. What I would say is that, again, we're going to have to have the right biomarkers that are going to be able to tell us, is, is it important enough to risk the, the safety of the, of, the, of the subject to be able to see whether they actually are going to have that effect, sort of like in, in this study, versus not. So we hope to be able to find some of those biomarkers that will tell us. This is something that changed in those 50% of the monkeys and might be related to that change in humans. So, and it also gets to the question of the relevance of the, of the system um, of an animal model to human. And it's always the case that you, you, there may not be complete trans translation between the two, and you always have to proceed cautiously. So this provides us some evidence that there is maybe an effect, but we can't be guaranteed that that effect is, is going to be what we see in humans. Jay. Sorry. I, sorry, I should have brought that one up, yes. I know it's sort of below the Vietnam's radar. No, 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 it's not. I actually had it in other decks, but, uh, you know, there, there yeah. There was a patient who got cured with a signal yeah. therapy bunch who had one long response. Yeah. And there was some non response. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, we never have any predictors of response from that. We were not because it was um, a study that was uh, done so long ago when we wanted to go back to the cells, they were not viable to be able to t uh, tell us anything about those responses, unfortunately. I think we were, I missed going back and forth, and I really, maybe we should wrap it up, or? Yeah. So maybe one, one, one last question. Two, I guess. Okay, two. I, um, <laughs> I could talk to you later. <laughs> I had a question. There's one molecule that is not in your list, which is CTLI4, right. for which you also have an antibody. Right. So, 
Recently, uh, Sharon and Lewin right. uh, in Australia, they published the first data they have seen in humans. Right. Are you seeing a dilemma uh -huh. uh, yep. on, on a patient with melanoma? Right. Can you comment on that? Because the data that is in that mm -hmm. paper is so weird. I couldn't get my way around and <laughs> understand what is there. So could you comment on that? Because it's very similar to feeding one. Mm -hmm. it, it is and it isn't. It's like on different, different cell subsets and these sort of things. It, it's true. It's why aren't we testing that? It's a matter of also balancing out safety um, and balancing what we, we can and, and should do. So ipilimumab is, is actually excellent treatment for melanoma, but it's not without its side effects. And when you look at the spectrum of the, of the agents that we have, PDL1, PD1 is slightly or somewhat more more uh, gentle, we'll say, then. So, so Steve, can I just add that? It's not simply the safety. Mm -hmm. When you look at the biology of PD-1, PDL-1 on the one hand, and CPLA-4, CPLA-4 acts very much downstream. And attacking PD-1, PDL-1 seems a lot more promising a target than CPLA-4. Additionally, we do have clinical data on CPLA-4 and CPLA-4 in HIV. It didn't do oh, very yes. much. Very interesting observation from Sharon, but we think that the more promising um, checkpoint inhibitors are more upstream of that. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot about the uh, old data. Could you just comment on where in the developmental path um, PD, PDL1 is in in humans, humans right now? And the question is, should we pause PDL1, did you say? PDL1. It's in human <laughs> trials with the ACTG at the moment, in HIV, in fact. Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> Are you at liberty to say anything? I can't actually say very much about it, but now that you asked, it's, it's uh, something that needs to be addressed. And, and it's, it's nothing that is about the safety of the patients. It was uh, a, something that was seen in a long-term animal study that... No, 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 no. The, the, it was like a long, like three-month dosing, um, multiple doses, high dose, and we decided for the, for the sake of caution and the sake of the safety of the, of the subjects in the A5326 to put it on hold. The FDA agreed, and that's why it's on hold. But it's pending analysis of? It's pending more analysis. This, you have to realize, this was three weeks ago that we got this data. And so we reacted quickly. We, 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 we brought it to the attention of the, of the ACTG. And it was like almost instantaneous response on everybody's part. So it, it's, it's new data, and we're responding to it cautiously. And we won't know for a little while about what's happening, because there's a lot of analysis to do. Right, and the first dose of chlorine is now done, and everything is fine. Yeah, yeah, but it was, it was a low dose. It was 0.3 mg per kg. We're talking about high doses in the monkeys as well. Can you expand a little think, bit about what you're talking about? Yeah, can, can, I, can I pick that up? Sure. So uh, PDL1 has been tested in cancer patients. Over 200 have been evaluated. Uh, we know the safety of PDL1 in cancer patients. That's been published before. Mm -hmm. We had just started a study with the ACTG in HIV infected individuals who are suppressed. Um, we recently And, and, sa and safety studies such as the one that this, is, this was done, you know, you, you want to see 
there something. Is unique about HIV positive people in the safety signal, or this would apply to <laughs> HIV negative hepatitis as well? No, no, the safety signal was found in an animal model in a three-month chronic dosing study at multiple doses, uh, multiple uh, uh, concentrations to what we see in humans. So there shouldn't be anything peculiar to and it's not an infection model. It's just it's it's just in in a, a toxicity study that one normally does in development. Yeah. Out of respect for our next uh, speaker, yeah. I'd, I'd like to I hate to cut off the session, but we need to uh, we're running a little behind as it is. But thank you very much, Dr. Mason. Organizers, for the invitation, and I'm just going to be talking today about uh, some of the work we've been doing in Oregon, uh, and this is some of the uh, based on the recent paper publication that we just brought out from our group, looking at uh, B cell follicles and uh, the fact that um, there we can detect persistent virus even in animals that are, have elite control of, of our application. And then I'm just going to give a broad overview of why you know, this has implications for HIV cure research. Um, but I just want to start by just highlighting some of the things we know right now about the reservoir and how early it gets established. And you know, one of the things that we know is very early in infection, we see the reservoir being seeded in a particular subset of cells. And in particular, we, you see most of the viral DNA detected in uh, CD4 memory T cells. And if you look in the blood, this is just an example of some animals that uh, we treated very early, looking at day 7, day 10, day 12. We see that very early on, most of the virus we can detect is mostly in the memory compartment the different memory T cell subsets. Even when you look in the lymph nodes as well, you actually see that a lot of the virus we can detect is in the lymph nodes. Um, and we see it within the small subset of CD4 memory cells within the lymph node called follicular helper T cells, which I'm going to come back to much later. Um, the other thing we know now is that when you treat very early in, in acute, during acute infection, you can significantly reduce the amount of virus that replicates. Um, and this is an example. You have some monkeys here that are treated at day, between day four and five. We can see we have you know, just very low levels of, of viremia that was very brief. If you delay that treatment by 24 hours within that very early hyperacute phase, you, you slightly increase the amount of virus that replicates, and it continues like that. So what is the consequence of this? Well, when you treat early, you significantly affect the amount of virus you can detect very early on during infection during infection. And so, you know, we see here animals that were treated just between the first four days. We look in the blood after six weeks, six weeks of therapy. We see very low levels of the virus that we can detect, at least viral DNA that we can detect. Um, when you wait 24 hours, you actually begin to see that there are more animals that have more detectable virus. You wait another 24 hours and treat at day seven. We actually see all the animals that we treated at that time point, we could detect we have, a, have detectable virus that is present. And so when you treat early, especially during the hyperacute phase, you significantly affect the amount of viral DNA that you can detect long term after treatment. Now, this is quite interesting to us because when you take these animals, especially animals that we could hardly find any virus in after a long period of time, and you keep them on therapy for a couple of weeks, we look longitudinally and we don't see any signs of detectable virus. Um, we look at the lymph nodes, we look in the blood, you know, at least at the limit of detection with the assays we currently have available, we can see the virus over a long period of time. And um, this is an example, one animal was treated at day four, one animal treated at day five, and we looked longitudinally, you know, up to 180, almost 200 days after treatment, and we couldn't really detect the virus. And this profile is, really very similar to some of the earliest treated patients that uh, are now being followed in San Francisco by uh, Steve Deeks and Hiroya Hitano, um, where when you treat really early on, you have a very small amount of virus that's detectable, uh, amount of plasma virus that you can detect. And after a long period of time, they've sampled over many periods of time, and they've not been able to find the virus by many different assays and through many different uh, uh, procedures. But one of the things we've, we've found in, uh, in the non-human primate model is that uh, with the ability to do this type of experiments in non-human primates is that when you take cells from these animals that we really can't detect virus from, 
all the viruses at very low levels, and we, we transfer them to uh, animals that have no, have no healthy animals, animals with no sign of infection, we actually see that we can actually transfer the infection to new animals, uh, which is quite remarkable. So we take, like here, we took 30 million cells from the lymph node, we put them into animals that have never seen the virus before, and these animals become infected. Uh, now, the transfer of those cells really equated to about between one to four copies of viral DNA. So, you know, we're saying that you only need a very small amount of virus to transfer to a new animal that's never seen the virus before for that animal to begin to get infected. So, which is, means is that when you treat early, it really has no clinical impact. So, monkeys are, these two monkeys treated between day four and five, you know, by our current assays, we couldn't really de detect. Um, when you compare that to animals that are treated much later on, it doesn't seem to make any difference because it tells you that, you only, that only one copy of the virus is probably sufficient to induce viral rebound. Uh, and this is very important for cure because our goal now is instead of reducing the, all, uh, the virus significantly, it means that we probably have to get rid of every virus in the body to prevent the virus from coming back. And that really is a very t tall tall order. So some of the things us and a lot of groups obviously around the world are trying to understand is really how does the virus persist and where does it persist long, long term. And this really brings us to some of the studies we've done in uh, animals that are on therapy. And what we've done is that we've looked at the lymph nodes uh, and we've sorted different memory T cell subsets within the lymph nodes. And one thing that is quite striking is that when you look at uh, uh, CD4 memory T cells, and uh, we can divide them between the CD4 cells that we call follicular helper cells, which are really located within a follicular region within the lymph node, and then the non-follicular cells. We find that, um, that within these follicular helper compartment, which are only like 14% of the total T cells within the lymph node, we see high amounts of viral RNA when you compare that with the cells that are non in, not in follicular er areas of the lymph node, they're much lower. And this, this viral RNA is almost five times higher within the small subset of follicular helper T cells than the non-follicular helper cells. Um, we can see that in the lymph nodes or even in the spleen in monkeys that are treated with different types of SIV. Um, and so we really wanted to understand this. Why would the small subset of CD4 cells that are located within the lymph node have so much viral RNA, even though the amount of DNA was the same, but the amount of RNA was is much higher. So this really comes us to, brings us to this picture of trying to understand <coughs> where these cells are located and whether the location of these cells allows the virus to potentially replicate at a higher rate than in, in not other areas of the, of, the T of the lymph node. And so I, this is just an example of uh, staining within the lymph node. Uh, these follicular helper T cells, we can identify them with certain markers. So they are CD4 positive, they are PD1 positive, and they are also positive for CD200. And uh, this is a marker for B cells, which is CD20. When you put these three together, you can see that most of these cells are clustered within a particular area of the lymph node. Um, this area we, is where most of the B cells are, and we call these, this is really referred to as our B cell follicles where we have a large population of CD4 cells that are not in the, in the T cell zone, and most of them, which, we, which are outside the follicle, which we refer to as the T cell zone. And so what we're saying is that most of the uh, five times higher amount of RNA is detectable within the small CD4 T cell subset called the follicular helper T cells that are located within these B cell follicles. So why is this important? Well, <coughs> Because the CD8 cells, which are these effector T cells that actually recognize viral infector cells and actually kill viral infector cells, uh, really lack the appropriate receptors that allow them to go into these B cell follicles. And if you can see, this is like the example uh, staining of the whole lymph node. In red, we're looking at CD8 cells. In, in white, we're looking at CD20, which is for B cells. In white, you can see B cells are clustered within these follicles, which we're referring to as B cell follicles. And uh, we see most of the red staining is outside of these B cell follicles. And so, you know, generally CD8 cells don't really have the appropriate receptors that allow them to traffic into these B cell follicles to effectively take, uh, eradicate or to effectively kill virally infected cells. 
So you know, the question we wanted to know was really is this, is it because the B cell, CDA cells can't get in there to clear out these cells, is that why the virus is able to persist there even in monkeys on therapy? So we really wanted to try and address this question in a methodic, methodical way and that really came to the uh, publication that we just uh, released right, uh, recently in Nature Medicine which is spearheaded by Yoshi Fukuzawa in our lab. And what we did is that we took monkeys that had varying degrees in the ability to control the virus naturally. So we had monkeys that were regular progressors, so they had plasma viral loads uh, over 85,000 copies in the blood. We had animals that were semi-controllers, so they had plasma viral loads around 1,000 to 2,000 copies. And then we had these really what we call elite controllers who are able to control plasma viral loads to really low levels. And in most of them, you know, it was below 600 copies. Some of them are 60, some of them are undetectable. It's quite amazing their ability to control the uh, plasma virus. And so our hypothesis is really whether the ability for the host itself to control viral replication, is it, does it now begin to restrict the a virus to these B cell follicles. In other words, if the virus, ha if the animal has CDA cells that are very effective at killing viral infected cells, it would ex you would expect that most of the cells, uh, most the, that the CDA cells can recognize the, the, these viral infected cells and clear them. But if those, uh, if, if if in those monkeys that have very efficient CDA <coughs> killing, have CDA cells that cannot penetrate the vir uh, the B cell follicles, then we should be able to still see residual viral replication going on within B cell follicles in elite controllers. And so that was the basis of the study we, we were proposing. So to try and address this question, we have uh, a co-culture assay which we use to detect replication component virus. And it's, it's a basic simple system, and don't to confuse you with all the, all the diagrams here, but just to tell you that we are able to stain cells, sort them for, for based on their different phenotypes and with different T uh, cell markers, and we can isolate the populations we're looking at. So, in the lymph node, we can take lymph node cells, we can stain them with all the different uh, markers that recognize follicular versus non follicular cells. As you can see here, we can then sort out these different populations separately, either the follicular helper or non follicular helper cells, based on their different phenotype. And then we culture them in, a, in, in vitro with a, a cell line that is susceptible to SIV, which, is, which are called CEMX, CEMX cells. Now, the basis of that would be if there is replication component virus present within any of these T cell comp compartments, then the virus should undergo a cycle of replication and then I'll go on and infect our CMX susceptible cell line. And then we can then measure that by, by staining those CMX cells and looking for virus within them. So this is basically the assay that we use for a lot of these studies going forward. And you know, just to give an example of this, so we have two monkey, four monkeys here. Two of them were infected with the stupid wild type SIV MAC239, and two monkeys were infected with an attenuated strain of the virus, which we're calling uh, 239 delta F. Uh, when you infect with wild type virus, you actually see just a uh, the normal progression of plasma viral loads where you have a peak, post-peak control, and it's maintained at certain levels during the clearing phase of infection. While in animals infected with the attenuated strain, you know, they had a, a lower peak plasma viral load, but with time, these animals were able to really effectively control this attenuated strain. When we used a uh, co-culture assay and we isolated cells from the lymph node at day 14, which is around the time of peak plasma viremia. When we looked at all the different T cell subsets, subset compartments and we, with uh, looking for replication component virus, we can actually see that every compartment we looked at, they were positive for replication component virus, whether the follicular and non-follicular area. But interestingly enough, by the time these, that you see these plasma viral loads diverging around day 98, where we're beginning to see a more effective control of plasma viremia. When we look at the chronic phase, we can see viral pr productive infection in all the T cell subjects we looked at. However, in the animals infected with the attenuated strain that have more control of virus, we see that most of the non follicular cells, we aren't able to detect replication complement virus. All, the only replication complement virus we could detect was mainly within these follicular helper CD4 T cell compartments. And this was maintained long term, where you look at over after 274 days, 
we actually see what even the chronic monkeys, all the subsets are still able to control virus, while in the attenuated strain, most of them are not able to, no, there are no virus detected in all the subsets apart from your follicular subset. So we go, went back to our original study and said, okay, what happens in the monkeys that have different degrees of viral control over time? We see in the progressors, if you just take a snapshot, there's a, there's a snapshot of three, two progressors who have high plasma viral loads. When you isolate your CD4 T cell subsets from your lymph node, we can see that all the subsets we isolate all have plasma viral, uh, detectable replication common the virus. As the animal begins to have some degree of control, in other words, the CD8 cells are here probably a little bit more effective at controlling plasma virus, we begin to see that uh, uh, there is a divergence. In one animal here, we see he is not able to control anything, but in another animal, we see gradually there is some form of control of virus where it's mostly restricted to these follicular cells. And in animals that have really elite control of plasma varium, in other words, the CD8 cells seem to be very effective at controlling virus, we see most of the virus we can detect is mostly within the CD4 follicular helper CD T cell subsets and not, and not in the non-CD4 helper and non-follicular subsets. So this is just a graphical representation of what we're seeing. He, the, of this assay for replication company virus, where this high population is referring to our follicular subset, and we can see sig that significantly in all the elite controllers, the amount of replication company virus we can detect is highest within that subset, while in the non follicular areas, we see that we are not able to detect replication company virus um, over time. When we look at the semi-controllers, then we begin to lose this difference. This was a little bit high here, but for most of us, there is no difference. And the progressors, there actually is no difference in the amount of replication common virus you can detect. When we looked at plasma uh, cell-associated RNA, we actually see that most of the RNA, or a higher proportion of RNA, is located within this follicular helper C cell subset. Um, even in the elite controllers, as well as the semi-controllers, but in the progressors, there is no difference in the amount of RNA you can detect uh, in all the different T cell subsets. But when we look at DNA overall, DNA was similar in all the subsets you looked at. So RNA is higher, but DNA is similar. So it's giving you some indication that there is potentially some ongoing replication going on within that T cell subset, uh, within the follicular helper subsets that is not present presently going on in the non follicular helper subsets. And this is just a you know, graphical representation of this. If this is the lymph node, this is an elite controller. We have two zones. We have this follicular area where the B cells are mostly located, and we have the non follicular area, or we will be referred to as T cell zones. In an elite controller, we can see most of the virus we can detect by an ultra sensitive uh, uh, assay, which we refer to RNA scope, which allows you to see viral RNA at very low levels. We can see that most of the RNA we can detect uh, in, in infected cells are in these follicular cells, and we can't detect them outside the follicles. Uh, and, but compare that to a progressive where we can detect SIV RNA within cells that are located outside the follicles as well as inside, inside the follicles. And this is just a, a graphical representation of that, showing that most of the cell, viral infected cells you can detect in elite controllers are mainly within, localized within these B cell follicles. So really it gives you a picture that if you have effective CDA control, you can control most of your viral infection within these T cell zones because the CDA cells can potentially traffic within those areas. However, because they lack the appropriate receptors that allow them to move within the follicles, you still see persistent infection within that follicular area, even in animals with elite control. Now, to really test this hypothesis, whether this was true, we decided to do uh, an experiment where we take the CDA cells out. Because if you take the CDA cells out from elite controllers, then you can ask, well, if you take it out, does the virus then appear everywhere? Can you then see the virus replicating in the cells that are outside the follicles as well as the cells that are inside the follicles? So we decided to do that. We, as you can see here, these are a couple of monkeys. These were all in elite, uh, animals that had elite control. We uh, gave them a CD8 depleting antibody, multiple doses, 
And then uh, you can see in black here, this is the amount of CD8 cells we could detect in the blood and in the lymph nodes. And you can see after you give the antibody, the CD8 cells are depleted. Um, as you deplete the CD8 cells, what happens is that the amount of plasma you can detect in the, vir in the uh, virus you can detect in the plasma goes up because the CD8 cells are taken away. And that's what you can see here. Um, also, when we look at the uh, CD8 T cell responses, we actually see that we see a, a decline in responses around the time when the CD8 cells are depleted. And after the CD8 cells come back, these responses come back up again. I just also wanted to point out is that when the CD8 cells are gone, viral load goes up. When the CD8 cells come back to the level they were before, the plasma viral load comes back down, which showing that the, the CD8 cells are present and are able to control viremia uh, back to levels they were before. And also, we see that CD8 and, uh, in the lymph nodes, though, we didn't really seem to have an effect on um, NK cells because there are not very many NK cells. So we don't really think NK cells are really playing a role in this, but, but it seems mostly related to the CD8 function. So when we take CD8 cells out, what then happens? Well, we looked, this is an example of one monkey. You can see here, this was pre-treatment before CD8 depletion. Most of the replication component virus we could detect was outside the follicle, was in the subsets that are located outside the follicle. Uh, inside, uh, only in subsets we can locate inside the follicle, but outside we cannot detect. When, you take, when the CDA cells were depleted by day 10, we can see that all the C subsets, again, were able to, we were able to detect replication from the virus. Interestingly, by day 21, at which time the CDAs gradually started coming back, we begin to see a gradual restriction of the replication conflict virus to these more follicular cells, uh, which continued until day 98 when sort of CD8 cell restoration had occurred. We can actually see that all, only, it goes back to what it looked pre-treatment, where we see only replication common virus in these follicular subsets. So it really gives us an indication that the CD8 cells are important in controlling the virus. However, the, CD8, this, the, uh, the CD4 subsets that are located within these fo follicles seem to be somewhat preserved from these efficient CD8 killing that occurs within these elite controllers. And uh, this is just a graphical representation of this, where we have a couple of animals um, a couple of animals, pre-antibody depletion, we can see all, all the replication common virus we can detect is all within the follicular subsets. By day 10, after all the CDA cells are gone, we see that the, anti the amount of virus we can detect is now within all the T cell subsets, not just in the follicular region, in all the animals we were able to look at. But by day 21 and day 35, we see gradually that there begins to become a more restriction back to the follicular subset. And by after 100 days, after between 84 to 100 days after the CD8 cells are back, again, they look where they, like what they were before, where all the follicular helper cell, uh, cells are, all, are the only subset producing or showing us replication component virus. And this is just the viral RNA, just giving a detection of the viral RNA levels did not seem to change at all during this period, uh, neither did the DNA levels at all. So, you know, it did give us, a, 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 it did give us some uh, confirmation of our hypothesis that really the CDA cells were important in, um, in the control of, uh, of the virus into these B cell follicle areas. And the last thing we wanted to do was actually to determine whether um, there was any ongoing activation of the CD4 cells that could account for this. Because what happens is that when you deplete CD8 cells, there is an increase in some other cytokines um, that are able to activate CD4 cells. And when the CD4 cells are activated, it's potentially that the activation could have increased the virus and not because the CD8 cells were gone. So to try and uh, address this, we decided to give an IL, an, a cytokine called IL-7 to some elite controllers. And what IL-7 is able to do is actually to increase the amount of T cell activation. So if you see here, this is the amount of, um, this, if you, in, in black, these are animals that were given, um, these were animals that were given IL-7. So in red, animals that were given IL-7. In black, this is a CDA depletion. And we actually see that um, when you give IL-7, we don't see any change in plasma viral loads. However, sorry, so let me start at the bottom one, so I should have gone for first. But at the bottom, we can see that when you do a CDA depletion in black, we actually see some activation of the CD4 cells 
in, uh, which is probably induced by the cytokine response due, uh, as a result of the CDA depletion. When you give IL-7, which is in, in red here, these animals, you're able to induce the same type of T-cell activation within the CD4 T-cell subset. But even when you do that, you don't get any increase in, um, you don't get any increase or any change in the restriction of uh, this replication component virus outside of these follicular areas. So even just activating T cells is not enough. It means that you actually have to either take the CD8 cells away for you to begin to see replication common virus occurring within here, because even if you activate them with a cytokine like L7, it doesn't seem to change that, that dynamic. So really why, so let me summarize this first. So just in summary what I've said so far, under the conditions of when the uh, a, a host has some form of efficient control of viral replication, we actually see that they are not able to uh, eliminate the virus that replicates within these B cell follicular areas. And, and it's most likely because these CD8 cells cannot traffic into these full follicles to actually uh, uh, take care of the viral infected cells. And, it really suggests that these B cell follicles are like sanctuaries or like barriers that prevent the CDA cells from, from, from entering. And um, this could, uh, you know, also be associated with all the forms that, uh, of uh, immune control, immune activation that go on in people who are still on antiretroviral therapy, as well as in people who are uh, individuals who are elite controllers. If the virus is still replicating in these sanctuary sites, um, this could actually allow these events to still occur. And it means that these B cell follicles really are a barrier to any attempts to try and cure uh, HIV or, even, or SIV or HIV. Uh, but really the question why, why this is important for the cure agenda is because, as I said, you only need one copy of the virus to actually induce rebound, uh, rebound infection when, uh, when art is eliminated. And you know, a lot of attempts now are being made to try and use therapeutic vaccination to enhance CD8 C cells to be able to cure or to be able to uh, control virus when art is stopped in people who are currently on, on therapy. Now, you can enhance these CD8 T cells, but if the CD8 T cells cannot penetrate into the follicles, then you know, the virus is still going to be is still going to persist and you know you might end up having a situation like elite controllers but still the idea here is to cure because we know that even one copy of the virus that still persists can still give you viral rebound and it's definitely a question that we're, we're really looking at and trying to address and trying to see whether there are ways we can disrupt the follicles uh, uh, to be able to see whether we can you know to test the hypothesis that if we disrupt the follicles is it sufficient to clear out this residual virus and that is, that is located within these B cell follicles, uh, follicular areas, and would this really enhance cure? Um, and this is important to us because right now we have two studies going on that are associated with uh, using therapeutic vaccination and the CMV, based on the CMV vectors. And uh, I, I'm not sure if you all, I'm sure you all know, have heard about the CMV based vaccine that has been published and uh, that has shown that in the prophylactic setting, we are, uh, CMV based vectors are able to, have been shown to be able to clear infection uh, in, 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 a, in a challenge study in non human primates. And so it was really an obviously the next step to see whether you can therapeutically vaccinate individuals. And in this context, we, we have two uh, groups of monkeys that are now being, ther have now been therapeutically vaccinated. And, and yes, this is being followed right now. One is funded through the DARE Consortium and the other one through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And you know, everybody, uh, we are all anxiously looking forward to seeing what happens in a couple of months when we stop therapy and actually look at viral rebound. But even in that context, you know, we still have this issue that the virus is still located within these follicles and to what degree CMV vector responses generated by these CMV vectors can actually penetrate these follicles and actually eradicate the virus is still unknown. And it's definitely something we are working on and trying to, to uh, look at. But I just want to leave you with a final word from uh, Lewis Picker, um, who you know, has said recently that you know, he, there is, he, we believe a cure is possible. However, you know, as has been said today, you know, just there isn't going to be a magic bullet. It's really going to take a, a, a multimodal approach that will involve probably one or two or three different modalities uh, to be able to really achieve a full cure. Um, CMV vectors probably alone are really not really going to be sufficient to do it, and it probably would mean 
applying that with other techniques going forward to be able to, first of all, stop the spread of the virus, induce the latent virus to get reactivated, and then overcome the barriers of these sanctuaries that the virus has, um, either within the follicles or particularly even within the brain that a lot of people are looking into as well. Uh, to be able to begin to generate these sufficient responses that can kill and destroy these, fun, uh, these, uh, these reservoirs. And I think that, you know, I think what's needed over time is a detailed understanding of, of the basic immunology of latency and reservoirs, not just in non-human primates and in and people, to be able to really address these questions. And I'm glad now the, the, you know, the world is focused on this. And uh, hopefully with the right resources, uh, we should be able to begin to make really strong progress in that area. And I think I'm early on time, but just to thank a number of people, particularly Yoshi Fukuzawa and I group who did most of the uh, f uh, uh, elite controller work and all the other people in our team and um, our veterinary support that we get from the staff of the VGTI and the OMPRC. <coughs> And then most of the virology is obviously done by Jeff Lifson, who apologizes for not being able to be here, but the weather um, was a, a factor of him not being here. And so he asked me to come in his place. And also, obviously, all the people that fund most of the work we do. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Sure, where do I start? I guess I can. No, so uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. You should take CD8 cells away, the virus co goes up, but we, when the CDAs come back, they go back to where they were, and they go back to the state at which they were before. They, become, they go back to being elite controllers. So there's no change after that. Yes, okay, I'll stop and go back. <coughs> so your kind of results slide there for the, the vaccine, was, was that just the responders? Or are you now saying they're all responding? The vaccine? Yeah. Uh, so in the vaccine, these are, there's the two groups. Yeah. So we have the vaccinated group um, and the non-vaccinated group. Where they're two differently is because it was administered at different times. So these monkeys were all received out during chronic infection. These monkeys received out during acute infection. So the plasma viral load is different. So in blue are our controls and red are vaccinated monkeys. So the goal would be to look at the difference at the time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Steve, now go that way. Right. Well, most of the um, most of the CD8 T cells that have some form of effector response don't have CXCR5. I think CXCR5 is one of the main ones that allow them to traffic into the um, germinal centers and follicles. And actually, most of the T cells within the follicle express CXCR5 at high levels. So most of these CD8 cells have low expression or no expression of CXCR5, and so they're not really located within there. Um, there is, in, in very in progressive infection in monkeys that are really very, very sick, you might have a lot of CDA cells within that area, but that's really because of uh, uh, um, a complete disruption of the B cell lymph node architecture, and you have uh, um, uh, expansion of these B cell follicles, which has to do with late stage infection. And so during chronic infection, you might see CDA cells, but in elite controllers where the follicles are maintained, they're mostly excluded. So thank you, thank you for your presentation. I, I would like, I mean, you mentioned that the only thing we need to reset infection is maybe one infected cell right. in the tissues. Potentially, yes. And, and, you know, there is the general belief in medical virology that the likelihood of being infected by any virus is related to the dosage. Right. So how you combine these two things? I know this is right. a completely different setting because in the setting you are mentioning, is already infected in individual. Right. But it's like my understanding would be that one infected cell in general should not be enough to reset infection. Right. So and you know well 
that would be the, I would agree with that in the context of uh, a, a new infection, a new challenge coming in uh, with, 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 the, with the multiple barriers that exist for a new infection to take off. Um, in this context, especially in this uh, uh, setting of adoptive transfer, we are somewhat mimicking uh, a virus that is already within the system that is probably latent and can, that can now be allowed to take off. So in the context of you're taking art off, even if you still have one infected cell, uh, one cell that has replication common virus when drug is on, you take the drug away, the virus can come out. So there are less barriers for that one infected cell when it's already in the system as opposed to when it's coming in new. So, um, but you know, we don't know. I mean, it, the, the adoptive transfer experiment is quite striking because even when it's de undetected by, by the levels, we, the, the, the methods we have now, um, or the sensitivity we have now, it could be that you know, if we have different methods that are more sensitive, uh, we would detect more virus, but there are limitations to the assays that are currently available. And so the detection limit we have says there's, there's probably no virus or very low levels, but that might not be the case. So we probably have to de uh, you know, develop more assays, I think, that, that looks at more cells and screens more cells and then tells us what the true measure of the reservoir is, which I don't think we really know. Yes? Is there what, what, what you may be describing before the real estate presentation? Is a, is, is a protective mechanism that the monkey immune system has created in order to control the virus in small parts? Right. Whether you th whether the monk the, mus the monkey has developed this to do that specifically, or you think maybe the virus? I think it has to do more of the virus adapting to, to there because, you know, the virus. It may be more with the viral adaptation to pr to, to to preserve itself, so it can replicate there, but the monkey's immune cells can't penetrate there. So. So was it known whether or not in non Right, so in that picture I showed you, actually that is a, one of the earlier pictures I showed you, that actually is from an, uh, a healthy, this is actually from a healthy monkey. So for the most part, CDA cells are mostly excluded from B cell follicles. So it's, it's, a natural it's a natural thing, yes. So because really that's areas where B cells are mature and that's where they <coughs> mature and generate antibodies and then try and differentiate into plasma cells. So. It's more interaction between CD4 follicular cells and B cells that goes on within these B cell follicles than CD8 cells. But the pre-existing sanctuary the virus binds and utilizes. Right. It, it could be just like a, an opportunity since, since the virus, since these can't go there, they stay. Yes. So has there been or is there any thought of looking at the gene progression in those animals that only were infected with a single cell? Well, those monkeys, uh, those animals actually just, the virus took, took off. And, and once the virus takes off, it becomes like a regular progressive monkey. And so you don't really have any advantage, really, in terms of whether they control early or not. But they just, there was no chain. David. Thank you, Alvin. I guess I have one primary question, I guess. And, and that's that, you know, six years ago, so many studies were looking primarily at blood. And increasingly, there's the recognition that in order to look at pathogenesis and then look at interventional studies right. in both monkeys and humans, you probably need to be looking at the lymph nodes. Right. And I just wonder if the methodology for looking at the lymph nodes and where in the lymph nodes that people are, are looking, right. do they need to be doing it different than what you're observing based on what you have found here? Do they need to be looking at something different within the lymph nodes or measuring it differently? <coughs> Um, I think that, you know, for the most part, when I see a lot of studies with, in, in patients particularly, they look at whole, whole CD4 cells, uh, whole lymphocyte cells, or whole CD4 cells. I think that, you know, the lymph node, the CD4, the T cell population is very homo homogen uh, heterogeneous. You have different T cell subsets, different compartments. The virus might be more enriched in one compartment than the other. So I definitely think that going forward, it will be important to make sure we are looking at the right sites and looking at the right subsets. Uh, to actually see whether we're making an effect. So definitely I think that's the case. But you're right, it's very important not just to look at the blood, which I understand the reasons why the blood would be easy to access in people. Uh, but we realize now that the blood is not sufficient to give us real markers of, of clearance, or, especially now we're going into the cure arena, because a lot of the virus is in the tissues, not just in the lymph nodes, but you see them in the mucosa. 
And, and it's very important to make sure we clear those reservoirs and not just those in the blood. Yes. Did I understand you correctly that the receptor that prevents the cells from trafficking into the germinal centers is CXCR4? CXCR5. CXCR5? CXCR5. Okay. Yeah. That means the virus is still R5 tropic, right? Yes, this virus is specifically very much R5 tropic, yes. Well, yes. just you know, Tim Brown got his transplant and they would clear the virus. Yeah, yes, that's CCR5, not CXCR5. So it's, oh, there's a difference, yeah. C, 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 uh, CXCR5 is a chemokine receptor that allows uh, cells to traffic in behaviors. So do you see any, any, any potential way to sort of surmount this by changing the CD8 cells or something to allow them to get into the follicular compartment? So there was a, there's, a, there's a, some work done recently by Ar Amara in Atlanta who has shown that he had a vaccination regimen that said that he showed protection was associated with some CDA cells that, that were generated that could traffic to the um, f follicular region. So I mean, we're still interested to try and see whether that's the case. The other option is you, there are things available right now that can help us dissociate these the follicles. You can deplete them. You can you, there are antibodies that can somewhat disrupt them. That are things that we're trying we're testing right now to see whether we, we <coughs> allow the CDA cells to go in. Yes, you. So you know the the, 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 the the main thing about the CMV vaccine it's more very much an effective based vaccine um, where most of the responses are terminally differentiated effector cells that are not really predominant in the lymph nodes they're mostly in the tissues so uh, so I, I don't think that's the case but we haven't specifically looked. Great, well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.